our first one is Andy Sharman, who's all the way from the UK. He is a very much uh, specialising in web accessibility and uh, user interface, stuff like that. Uh, he's working in Sydney at the moment and, and living in Sydney right now. Um, but he's also done some work with the Joomla Extension Directory as far as user interface. And uh, today he's going to talk about um, HTML5 and all sorts of goodies. So I'll leave him. some of the new stuff that's out at the moment, ways that we can kind of enhance uh, Joomla websites, um, and how Joomla actually lends itself to a lot of new technologies in the way that it's actually, the way that it's already modular. Um, so, I'm Andy. Um, I work as a front-end developer in Sydney. Um, been here for about a year now. Uh, a lot warmer than me. I've been developing with Joomla for about three years now, since the early, early versions of 1.5. Um, obviously, as you've seen this morning from Jen, you've seen the massive improvements that have come through. Uh, the usability behind it is amazing, um, and Carl's a really great job on the administrative side. I've um, been working with the extensions directory for about two years now, um, trying to finally push through more enhanced extension directory listings. Um, not quite sure how many of you would have used it, but basically uh, they're trying to push through premium listings as well as just a better experience for people who are trying to find things for their online websites. Um, and I've been, for about the same amount of time, been developing my own open source extensions. If I see a niche that I think there isn't something out there already, then I'll try to fill it when possible, and if I ever make something, try and make it open source so everybody else can just go take it apart, do whatever they want with it. Uh, that's me. <laughs> um, just in a breakdown, what I'm going to try and cover is I'm going to cover, um, first of all, just go through the differences and the pros and cons between device specific templates. Uh, reactive and responsive templates. Um,
they'll just sit in the middle of the page. Um, problem is, however, that as soon as you get a uh, browser window, which is smaller than 960, you have horizontal scroll across the bottom because they just they won't resize themselves. They'll just stay how you told them to, and the content will still display exactly the same, but um, the browser won't display all of it. So what we can do with Reactive by using media queries is we can take into account that the top two elements would already be floating. They would be floating left and floating right. They, they might not, but the odds are that they're going to be floating either side. Um, so as you squeeze those two in, they're not really going to cause any problems. That's not going to be an issue. Um, we've got this full width J, uh, jQuery or move tool slider at the top. Um, now the odds are that this is going to be fixed width. It's going to be specified so that the overflow doesn't come through as they're scrolling through. Um, what we need to do here is change that width to 100%. And so remove any float that would be on it and just make sure that it's a block. And then what we do is the same for the container. So that the container around everything is width 100%. So when you develop that main bar that you're putting in there, mm -hmm. would you have that so it comes up the expanse, but then the image that gets cleaned inside be centered? So you, you don't want to load an image that's way too wide because yeah, then you're yeah, putting your, your bandwidth right up. Yeah. So would you be lowering that down and saying, okay, I'll make my standard image, say, 1,500 wide, yeah. like 200 high, yeah. and then making that centered on the page? Is that what you do there? Yeah, I'd be centering it. Because um, as you'd be resizing through Reactive, you wouldn't resize the image, so you would just be clipping it, essentially, um, which isn't always the best. But uh, generically, the clip going down from this resolution to the next breakpoint, which is usually tablets in portrait mode and laptop, smaller resolution laptops. Um, it's not an awful lot of the image that you would lose. Um, haven't yet come across where a slider has had to be the we've had to drop the slider on the first breakpoint because of the images being cut off too much. Um, but again it's entirely down to kind of personal choice. If you wanted at this point you could easily drop it and people on lower resolution devices wouldn't get that type of um, functionality on the page. It would be there in the markup, but it wouldn't be displaying for them. Um, also, you can see in the middle you've got these three columns that would be floating across. Um, now, normally what would happen if you resize their container, they're going to fall underneath each other, which I don't think that is exactly what we would want them to do. Um, so they're already kind of taking care of one of the breakpoints on their own. All you've got to do is change the width of their wrapper, and then they will get forced underneath each other as you shrink the screen down. <coughs> um, now, at the bottom, you've got the portfolio element, kind of just a few images going across the bottom. Um, personally, I would take this out at the next breakpoint. Uh, you can resize it, and you can start wrapping the images underneath. Uh, it really depends how it's going to look on the lower resolution. If you've got a feeling that it's not going to look great or the user wouldn't be really using it on a lower resolution tablet, then the odds are it's better to take it out. Um, again, the argument is that it's, it's still there in the markup and it's not really efficient out of there. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is give the user the best content available um, for their particular device, the stuff that they're ideally going to be looking for. So we need to ask, is a person user on a tablet going to be looking for portrait images um, that are in your portfolio, which may well be in the top level navigation as it is. So moving down to like a portrait or a low resolution wireframe, you can see that I've actually flipped out quite a few elements. Uh, rather than forcing the contact column onto to fall down underneath, I've actually taken it out. Um, arguably, because it's contact column, you may want that to remain on that home page, and you just want it to fall underneath. Um, but I was kind of targeting it as more of a generic kind of column rather than contact specific. Um, what we have here now is you can see that the top navigation and the top logo, they're squeezed in together to each other. 
This is just what would happen if you re a game like the columns. If you resize their container, they're going to start squeezing into each other. Um, and then you've got the big hero image across the top, which is just changed because it's with uh, 100%. Um, and obviously, the bottom navigation is tiny, so it's not going to cause us any issues. Um, one thing that's on a lot of websites at the moment is, well, not at the moment, the last several years, the big sideline navigations that they have at the bottom, where they've got four columns which have got every link to every single page throughout the entire website. Um, what you tend to have in that is, again, you have, like the content, you have these four columns floating next to each other. Um, and as you resize, generically, you wouldn't take out navigation, so you can just let them flop in with each other. Um, if you resize their container, they're going to just fall underneath each other, unless um, the original build was using some of that position absolute, which would not be ideal. Um, if that's the case, then we might have bigger problems further down the line anyway. So, um, obviously, resizing in the first place might actually kind of give a bit more of an impression. Um, and then we've got the third breakpoint, which is mobile devices, um, or really small tablets. Um, basically now I've taken out, or rather hidden, the slider that was at the top of the page. Don't really want to force a mobile user to be rendering that image sliding across too much. Um, and quite frankly, it's just an image that's stopping it from getting to main content. If it was, say, for example, a hosting website, which usually has things like deals on there or something like that. Uh, at this point, you might want to use something like CSS um, and child selectors. Uh, and child selectors are basically <coughs> items which can tell you which div in a certain group of divs you want to display and you want to hide. So you can use um, colon first hyphen child, and that will select the first child of that particular group that you've selected from. And then you could just display that and hide the rest of them. So you would only display one rather than displaying the rotation. How would you resolve the spacing of the menu? Like if it's a vertical, vertical, vertical kind of menu and you need, like if you're pressing it with the thumb, you need more spacing. How would you resolve that? Um, I mean, I saw one responsive uh, template which changed the menu into uh, uh, vertical tabs. Yeah, that's right. Um, the reason I didn't do it on this one is basically because there's only five, uh, five links there and they would fit nicely inside a mobile device. You're exactly right. If you have a larger navigation system and you have drop downs, um, then basically what seems to be the norm that's getting pushed through at the moment is, as you saw on the Joomla administration panel for 3.0 earlier, what will tend to happen is you'll have a box across the top. And it'll either say menu or it'll have like the standard three lines which will indicate that if you click on it, you're going to get a navigation appearing down. Um, that um, could, for the most part, can actually be implemented through CSS media queries. Don't even need to use JavaScript to do that. Um, the only point that you'd actually need JavaScript is for the actual menu appearing and disappearing. But that can be there all along. You don't need to implement that afterwards. Um, as you can see, the component and the recent articles are still on the page, but because we've squeezed them in, they've kind of forced one below the other. And the footer is kind of just sun at the bottom. Not really going well, because it's not a really big um, So you can see here, this is kind of primarily what most mobile devices will go to. If you go to a device specific, if you go to responsive, or if you go to a reactive website, this is ultimately what you're going to end up on as a mobile device. It's going to be core cool content, it's going to be very minimal media, um, and the navigation is going to be simple and easy. So this is a really slimmed down version of the media queries, which would be involved in taking a wireframe <coughs> like what I've just shown, and how we manipulate the breakpoints in order to hiding various elements or changing the width of them. Um, obviously this is kind of pseudo-code, so take it with a pinch of salt, it's not exact. Um, basically, the bit that we've got at the top, sorry, it's 
not really explain very clearly. Can everybody read it okay? Um, the segment that's at the top of the page um, is basically any screen devices that have a maximum width of 960 pixels. So this will take account for majority of tablets which are on portrait mode. Um, or even some older netbooks that are the 10 inch versions which are on really small resolutions. Um, so what you can see is I've made the Hero, uh, which is the big slide at the top, I've made that width 100%. Um, I've hidden the contacts um, column on the right hand side and I've hidden the recent projects which was sliding across the bottom. Now again you can kind of just um, you didn't have to remove the contacts and you didn't have to remove the recent projects. It's kind of something that you would take from what you would expect the users to be wanting to be hit when you get to the website. Um, another thing that I've just added in is the recent on the left hand side, say if you wanted to make it less prominent than the main content, you could kind of change the width of that to a percentage because they would probably be at a fixed width. Um, that way it would resize as you resize. And then what you would also add, um, which I haven't put on here, is a uh, minimum width. So if it hits a certain point, um, then it won't keep going any further. Um, that way the column is going to get to a certain point during your resize and it's going to stop resizing, which means that you would probably do that at around the 400 mark or the 350 mark. Um, basically, so when they're getting around 700 pixels wide, it's going to force it underneath the content. Um, moving down to what we're basically handling a lot of the mobile devices, um, you can see here I've got a lot more requirements and parameters. Um, this is the device pixel ratio that I was talking about earlier. Um, at the moment, it tends to vary between 1.5 and 2. A lot of mobile devices and tablets are still on 1. Um, so you need the first bit, which is 480 pixels, which is the standard sort of dimensions of a, uh, I think it's the iPhone 3G, it's 480. Just in two sentences, try and explain the ratio, the pixel ratio. Um, device pixel ratio represents how many pixels are injected within a pixel, so to speak. Um, so the MacBooks that have come out with Retina displays, um, they have these enormously high resolutions, um, but the screen size hasn't really changed. And when you view everything, they tend to be all the same size. Basically, the idea is to make the screen crisper. It's not to give you smaller icons or show more on the screen, it's to make it clearer and crisper. So, but what happens when you come through to the CSS, it still sees it as twice the resolution. So what you have to do is give it a parameter of twice the resolution and a device pixel ratio of two, which basically means that anything that is 980 or lower, 960, sorry, um, and has a device pixel ratio of two, we give them the mobile version. Um, that way, if you've got a retina display mobile device, it's um, going to get the mobile website rather than getting a regular website because their resolution actually appears higher. Those media queries there, yep. what's the lowest browser in IE land that you'll work on? Um, no. um, you can get uh, JavaScript libraries which will take over um, and they'll actually pass media queries for you, so it's kind of a include in the file and go kind of thing. Very much like um, HTML5 Shiv, uh, which is a JavaScript library that takes care of um, HTML5 elements just gives them basic support because older versions see new HTML5 elements as inline items. They don't see them as kind of what level items that they should be. Uh, and IE doesn't really, uh, if you use, say, nav or header, for example, inside CSS, um, it uh, won't be recognized by older browsers. Um, so you need JavaScript in place to kind of take care of that. Uh, just a couple of tools to help when you're trying to create websites like this. So we'll start with um, developing templates. Um, there's a website which 
I use for a lot of templates in it. Um, I work on called Initializer. Um, this is by the guys that use Boilerplate. Uh, Boilerplate is basically uh, ba basic plugins and framework kind of thing for. Uh, it'll give you a basic HTML document. It'll have all of your conditional set up for all of your Explorer devices. Um, and it'll also come in a prepackaged with HTML5 Shiv. Um, as I mentioned, takes care of older browsers with new markup um, or uh, modernizer, which does a similar job and it also kind of gives you a lot more bit of a framework to build upon. So if you wanted to utilize it to find out what kind of browser support you're getting on a particular um, page load, then you can use modernizer and things like that. Whereas I believe patient or five shift doesn't really give you that output on an answer list. Um, what I've also kind of brought up here is Mutools Mobile. Um, this isn't kind of like jQuery Mobile replaces jQuery. Mutools Mobile really works on top. It's kind of basically just to enhance the touch event um, and to make it so that your website's really working how it should on a tablet device. Uh, the biggest thing is just making sure that click handlers are up kind of working as they should be. Um, so just kind of uh, moving over to kind of Joomla 3.0. Um, the stuff that I'm going to show could easily be implemented on 2.5, probably not 1.5, but um, the reason I've marked it up as 3.0 is because the code example that I'm about to show um, is based on from Juma 3.8. Um, so placeholders and required fields. These are new attributes for form elements. Um, now placeholders are something that rather than having to have the JavaScript, which you can see in the first example, um, and also the value, um, placeholders basically just replace this. It's a native browser functionality that when you click in the box, um, it will just disappear. Uh, so whatever you set as a placeholder, say for example the search box, this is taken from modern underscore search, the default um, default.php inside of, it might be default underscore form.php, um, inside the tmpl directory in modern underscore, <coughs> con uh, modern underscore search. Um, so the first version is showing JavaScript solution, which basically takes the value um, if you click away from it and you haven't entered anything in, it puts the default value back in. And if you click on it and it is the default value, then it disappears as you start to type. The placeholder, as you can see below, the placeholder attribute does all of that for you. But again, this is something that is modern browser support, so it's kind of a decision that you have to take. Would you prefer to be using a placeholder attribute and kind of be pushing forward or is it really important that you support older devices um, and retain the JavaScript solution? Again, there's libraries out there which will take care of the backwards compatibility for you. So the JavaScript doesn't always need to be there and will only kind of run if you're in an older browser to fix any placeholders that you might be using on a particular page. <coughs> um, another attribute that you might see just there is required. Um, this is built-in client-side um, validation to a certain point. Now obviously we never want to replace server-side validation because anything that's client-side is manipulable by the client. But in order to make things just a little easier for the users, um, it's just nicer to have it without a page load, give them a little bit of a hint to say that they've actually made a mistake and they need to kind of rectify the stuff on the page. Um, required is IE9 support plus. Um, placeholder is, I think, later version of IE9. If you're in an earlier version, it doesn't really work properly for some reason. Um, in addition to the required build, there is another one which basically um, will validate, and you can use things like regex um, to validate the input. Again, it's just working in the same way that a JavaScript validation plugin would be running. Um, it's just that it's native browser, so it's going to be a lot more efficient, a bit less page load, but again, you're kind of sacrificing the legacy browser support. So 
it's kind of a bit of a something that you can use to kind of push forward rather than like not ignore the all the browsers, the IE servers. Um, one thing that I've been working on recently is a HTML5 um, location and Google Maps API v3 tool, which basically uh, we had a conversation at uh, work and basically discovered that the majority of people that are going to a business's website on a mobile device, they're tending to try and get in contact with that particular business. They're not really after a lot of elf like us. Um, Bless you, my girlfriend who loves ASOS and will just sit there for hours on an iPhone. Um, but basically, with this in mind, we took into the fact that that contact page is incredibly important on mobile devices and on tablets. So, knowing that all mobile devices and tablets support um, the majority of the new HTML5, uh, CSS3, and the uh, Google API is browser compatible as well. Uh, I think V2 was as well, but V3 has got a lot better. It's a lot better, it's not as clunky as it used to be. This code just here, um, basically, this is simply checking if navigator.geolocation is an object on the page and is available to use. Navigator.geolocation is the location-based API, which basically uh, you might have gone to a couple of websites before now where it's come at the top, do you want to share your location with this website? That's what this is doing, it's asking for your current location. Um, it's got two parameters for the get current position, um, and basically they're callbacks. Because it's a delayed event where you have to wait for the user to input and then come back, you can't just simply stick it inside an if statement and expect a true or false because you need to wait for it. It's like using a timeout, for example. You need to give it a callback afterwards, which it will then run with. Um, then what you've also got is basically what's going to happen if you come to this page in ISO and try and use this particular functionality. It's going to tell you that it doesn't exist. And on this particular event, I've just took down an alert <coughs> because it's on on old click, I'm not asking for location on page wise. But what you could do is utilize this function to strip out um, any kind of geolocation related forms or buttons so that all the devices, they just get an address and a telephone number, whereas new devices will get this kind of functionality. Um, just to try and display how this kind of works, um, just done a quick little demo, it basically shows you how uh, how to get to Sydney Opera House from where you are. Um, this, um, the Google API allows you to either pick walking or driving directions, very important because the user might not necessarily be on foot already, they might be in a car. Um, so if we go for, I'm walking from my current location, and then it won't load. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, let me just try one more time. Okay, there we go, it works. Um, so now obviously with, uh, for anybody that's used Google Maps API already, you know that you can set the default zoom level, I set it deliberately further out, um, and you can also kind of set the default geolocation of the map, so if you wanted the map in there in the first place, you can load it and then utilize it to show the directions. You don't have to just only <coughs> show it for this particular purpose. And just go a little bit more. This is completely based off of me giving it an address. Um, when you retrieve the uh, geolocation of a particular user, it will actually give coordinates at a latitude and a longitude. Um, obviously, most people don't know the latitude and longitude of their business address. So, um, through this, I've actually used just Sydney Opera House, Sydney, New South Wales, and it's worked perfectly. That's all I've handled, passed over to Google. Um, and we're actually, I'm working with uh, a couple of guys at the moment to actually turn this into a component which can be passed properly. Um, and then all you'll do is in the back end type in 
your address of your current business and then just be available on the front end. So pass that through. Um, I think what you've highlighted there is, is that responsive design actually needs to be responsive to the user, not, not to the device. Yeah. In other words, the user, what, what, what do they actually want from yeah. your, your information? Yeah. Um, yeah, basically what I've tried to kind of push for is that you're always trying to show the content for the particular user. Correct. Um, obviously, all you've got to know about is the device that they're using. So what you have to do is go on go on demographics of what the kind of user is going to be, what, is the, what a user on that average device is going to be trying to do. Um, and if they're on a mobile structure, the odds are that they're going to be trying to get in touch with the business or find basic information about that business. They're, they're not going to really be too interested in um, your blog or the latest yeah. programmer information. And the JET is a perfect example where not much responsive design has gone into that uh, yeah. because you're not going to go to the JET to yeah. download components from your iPhone. Exactly. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, that's exactly true. It's, it won't even be... Uh, it's not really being talked about too much in the actual upgrades, which is being pending <laughs> so long now. Um, so, right. Um, just moving on. I'm um, not sure if many people have heard of HTML5 local storage. Uh, this is actually kind of being kind of removed from the original HTML5 specification because it's actually got too complex. Um, and it's actually, it's, it has its own specification now. Um, and you've also got alternatives such as um, HTML5 databases, um, which use a MySQL-like syntax. Uh, there's two that are running around at the moment. Um, neither of them have particular great adoption, um, and you won't see them being used too common anytime soon. So I've not really covered those. However, HTML5 storage is a IE9 upwards, so it's actually something you can realistically start using to enhance users' experience. Um, the two functions that we've got here are part of an object which I created. Um, you can see they just got get pref, get preference, um, and basically you're giving it the type or the name of that particular preference that you were trying to retrieve from the HTML5 storage. Um, and it's checking if it exists, <coughs> then it's pulling it out. Uh, the reason that you can see json.pass there is because you can only use strings when you're storing inside HTML5 storage, so you can't just stick a JavaScript object in there, it won't have it. So what you need to do is use JSON to just simply stringify it and pass it when you bring it back out again. Um, I mean, you could use XML if you really wanted to, but uh, JSON is a much simpler solution and a lot less overheads for passing inside JavaScript. Uh, you also notice this, I'm not really using any particular frameworks JSON there, that's like the native vanilla JavaScript JSON object. Uh, if you wanted to kind of make sure that it was working exactly how it should do cross browser, then you probably want to use either the Mutools uh, JSON handler or perhaps the jQuery JSON handler, which basically just takes care of some of the quirks that the different browsers do to the different uh, JSON parsing. Um, then you can see the function below, just a set preference uh, type and then just value. Really, really simple to use. Um, and then you can see there that I've got the JSON string file, which will kind of push that value in. Um, I've just got a quick example to show you. It's just Really, really basic way of enhancing kind of pages experience, just a given preference. Uh, what you'll see on a lot of, especially government websites, you'll see what's in that top right hand corner, or you'll see the AAA, which is basically representing that this page will zoom in and make just make the text larger, make it easier to read for people that um, are uh, visually impaired or just that it's harder to read sometimes. Um, now, obviously this isn't the only use case of this, it's just one of the first ones that came to mind. It's an easy preference to store and it's one that's quite common throughout a lot of websites. Um, so you can see, as you click through, it gets really big. And you can see now, 
Arnold Lipson, which is the Arnold Schwarzenegger version of Laura Lipson. Uh, oh, okay. Cookies are a little bit more awkward, and that legislation is actually they're, just, they're trying to push it um, out here as well. It's it's so it may well get through. It really shouldn't have gone through in the EU. These things sneak through the cracks. And HTML point of storage is a great way to work around right. using JavaScript cookies. Um, and cookies, no e-commerce. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's going to be a big problem. Um, you can still use them. You just have to get the prompts. Um, but you wouldn't really want to have to give a prompt just for something as simple as this. So it's, um, and also this will be a lot simpler on mobile devices. I think cookies are a little bit awkward with some of the older HTC devices, which haven't been upgraded. Um, and so yeah, um, this is what quicker than I thought it was going to be actually. But um, basically, any questions? Um, kind of dancing around a bit deliberately to try and give a bit more of kind of a broader insight into the things that are there and the things that we can do, um, both to existing templates and possible functionality for extensions that you might be working on. Can we make your slides available for users later on? Um, all the slides for all the sessions are going to be online. Yeah. Uh, this is all on the back of the website. Completely available. I'm including the demonstrations. They're all up there. Just go and have a play around, down the source code, and break it. It's, it's all there for everyone to use. I'm not really too precious about my work. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so uh, yeah, that's about it. So, no one has any more questions? Yeah. Um, can you explain the difference in the media queries between screen, only screen, and all that? Uh, uh, screen only is basically that if you are using a screen device in the view of what you're viewing. So you don't want it to be trying to do stuff like this or hiding elements when you've got a bot coming through calling your information. Um, if you take out screen only, uh, the CSS will apply to pretty much everything. Um, because the width doesn't really apply to bots, um, if you're hiding information on your website, Google will tend to ignore it, um, and so will screen readers. So you don't really want that kind of level up. It's more of an appearance thing than uh, functionality. So you basically, you just want it to be screen specific items. Yeah. Okay. So did you have a, sorry, just to check. <coughs> that was, um, you only really judged on sort of screen and certain widths. So you had a bunch of widths that you were, you were breaking on and then... Yeah. Um, basically, I was working with kind of the, the, the idea of using a reactive. Um, yeah, yeah. Just have a couple of breakpoints. Yeah. The one that would be covering portrait devices like tablets and low resolution laptops. Yeah. Um, and then you would want the other one for mobile devices. They think to be the standard to they use. Sometimes we'll get a couple in between just to make it a little nicer. And, but the more breakpoints that you add in, the closer you get to responsive, the more time you're spending on it. Mm -hmm. So it's, as I said earlier, it's kind of how much time you want to invest in making it mobile worthy. Um, with the HTML5 storage, mm -hmm. that's going to be a browser similar to the way cookies are handled now? Yeah. Um, HTML5 storage, because it's been, um, all of the browsers at the moment have actually used uh, the W3C's kind of write-up for it, which basically says that yeah, it, it works in a similar way to cookies. The only difference is that um, a lot of cookies actually get destroyed as you close the browser. HTML5 storage will stay there forever. Uh, so will they be able to clear that information the same as yeah. can do with cookies? Um, if you use a uh, shortcut for Chrome, Firefox, and Safari, Control Shift Delete or Apple Shift Delete, um, you'll now see that there's a new item on the list of things you can delete and it's HTML5 storage. So what are there similar limitations in that to cookies? I mean cookies never really meant to store you meant to dark Um HTML5 storage can take a lot more. Um, and on top of the whole localized storage, um, if they are kind of working on ways that we can actually have localized databases. Uh, this is kind of it's not secure so you can't put anything sensitive in there. 
Uh, the idea is usually for people that are wanting to make things like HTML5 games using things like WebGL or Canvas and um, uh, the more localized stuff, the less mm -hmm. to and fro from the server. Or like the site history, navigation history. Yeah, exactly. Services. Anything like that. Um, so localized databases, I reckon <coughs> they won't be used so much on your regular day to day websites, but you probably see them a lot. Um, a lot of good HTML5 games are starting to really crop up. Um, I saw recently, uh, I think it was a couple of guys from the Mozilla team who kind of almost replicated the basics of Minecraft. Um, so obviously Minecraft is a low graphics kind of interface, uh, lots of block level and kind of triangles, so it's really easy to draw inside a browser. Yep. I don't know whether this is a smart question or not. HTML5 storage, what sort of security issues are there with that in terms of hacking? Um, it ultimately is client, so it's as secure as your computer is, or as the user's computer yeah. is rather. So it's, um, what you'd argue is you handle it in a similar way to cookies because they are also local, mm -hmm. um, and that you would use something on the server to encrypt, um, so that you would have some kind of key or hexacone bit for decrypt the information that is stored locally. Um, so you've kind of got that connection between the server-side code and the client-side. Um, but then, on the other hand, if it's not particularly important information, then it's as, as you want to handle it. I mean, most people will say encrypt regardless. It's going onto a client machine. It could be used in some way or form. But if it's somebody's high score, and unless you're particularly precious about them manipulating that high score, then it's, it's not a particularly yeah, important piece of information. So it's overhead versus um, security. So in a lot of instances of HTML5 storage, you're storing it locally ultimately, so you're risking it being mm. breakable or decrypted through brute force. So it's um, same. I wouldn't recommend wouldn't recommend storing any kind of secure information or sensitive information through HTML5 storage, just as you want it through cookies. So with, with yeah. the session cookies, mm -hmm. do you think they'll be affected by this change in the... Uh, the the same thing that's come through the EU? Uh, yeah, it is session cookies. That so are even to put a session cookie on the computer, they're going to have to yeah. from. The, the main so thing that they've uh, added to that legislation is that you can kind of... <laughs> as long as you're telling them that it's happening, um, then it's okay, but you basically need to give them an out. And most, what most people are doing is sending them to Google if they are, <coughs> if they don't want to use cookies, then they're sending them away from the website because they just can't handle it. Uh, a lot of websites, majority of websites, are using pre-built systems. Pre-built systems use cookies. <coughs> they use them for logins. They use them for tracking. Even Google Analytics will use cookies in order to track them on how they're going. So it's if. A user just says, well, I don't want you using cookies, then there's a lot you can do. It's, there's a hell of a lot of work involved in making a website that works well without cookies. Yeah. So it's, yeah. But I know they're trying to push it out, um, and, but I can't see it coming through anytime soon, so wouldn't be too worried out here. Uh, but if you go to the EU or if you're serving EU customers, then it might be something you want to take into account. Cool. Uh, yeah. So there's a few other questions. Oh, yeah. Uh, does hidden content mean that it's also hidden from the SEO point of view? Um, because media queries are only kind of really affecting um, the uh, media queries only really affect screen devices, um, so you, yeah, um, basically that display none stuff won't be uh, won't be affecting a Google call that comes through because it won't pay attention to media queries. Um, it may pay attention to it if you have media queries which are kind of saying anything under like, 4,000 pixels wide, hide all of this media query content on Google for you. Um, it's, it's Google's really advanced now. It will go through your style sheets, it goes through your JavaScript, and it picks out what you're hiding and how you're hiding it. Um, so it knows that if you've got media queries, it's usually there for usability. So if you're just there, if you're putting stuff in place to make it more usable for the user, uh, the odds are Google will not punish you for that. Um, in fact, 
that's what their general method is. Like they don't release their kind of secret lexicon or whatever it is. Um, but what they always say is, if you make a website accessible and you know, make it easier to <coughs> use, then you will not get an understanding. You'll actually go up in rankings. So by doing one, you get advantages. Yeah. Just automatically. Right. Yeah. I'm just wondering, from from the point of view when you're talking to clients about responsive websites and stuff like that. Yeah. And this is a bit of an argument I'm having with other people online as well. Yeah. And the same as the bloody compensated extension center. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yesterday when they were talking about the same sort of stuff. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that are coming out um, saying that it's actually more expensive to design a responsive website. And the argument being that if you're not doing a responsive or and or reactive website is that you are then having to develop and maintain a whole heap of templates yeah. that are device specific. Yeah. So your actual cost, once you do 10 different templates, yeah. is a lot more yeah. um, as opposed to just doing one template that has responsive or reactive elements within it. Yeah. And then you're only maintaining that one template. Yeah. Um, that everyone keeps saying uh, it's longer to do this, it's more expensive to do this. It's kind of a... Not if you're doing 10 templates or yeah, 3 yeah. templates or 2 exactly. templates. If you've got a set of templates yeah. which all have similar structures, um, and if you <laughs> want to create like one of those specific templates, yeah, you're going to have to create several of them. Whereas if you've got the opportunity to use something that's reactive or responsive across the board, it's going to handle the way that the structure of the website moves around, and it's going to be it's, it's going to be a lot lower as far as costs and budget. The question with this that that then leads into one of the big things that you've got to do now when you're doing like if you embed a page into Facebook, for example, you've got an 810 or lower resolution. Yeah. Facebook, when you plug it through, does the responsive design pick up that chain? So again, you're only designing one template, and then you can just plug Facebook into it and it picks it up, or is that not? Yeah. Um, I think you're referring to the Facebook pages rather yes. than the applications, right? Yes. Um, I only have a small touching on the actual Facebook pages, so i um, more than happy to do a bit of research and check in for you. Um, is that something that I'm I've got a lot of clients now that what they want to do is embed certain elements. Mm -hmm. And a classic is shops, they want to embed their shop in Facebook. Yeah. Um, and if we design a responsive design template, it does that. So then yeah. instead of me having to design this template for this, and then one specific template just for Facebook, that might solve Yeah. No, because it's my frame. Um, just getting a cut off sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just answer this really quickly. Um, basically, because it's an iframe, it's fixing basically document width to 810 pixels, so you'll get the uh, same view.